But it's great to be with you guys today and talk about some of the changes we see happening in this platform business model. Uh, it, is, it is really interesting. I assume this is forward, yeah. I mean, if you look at various areas, that, errors that have occurred uh, from a, uh, an industrial perspective and say a business model perspective, you know, obviously we all remember the manufacturing area, finance, a lot of what happened of late, uh, which maybe led to some of the disruptions of 2008, were driven off of that model, or a lot of capital flows moved out of production but in the financial sectors, instruments, et cetera. And now we're into this new thing called platform networks and business models. Now, if you, obviously, with Brexit and all the things going on and the political rhetoric, you say, well, geez, these global things, you know, are, are uh, being threatened. Uh, they're a thing of the past. Globalization's run its course. Nationalism is now taking over. Uh, I don't really see it that way. I think, you know, perhaps there's a reaction to what's happening, but the people that articulate it, and they maybe have some appeal from a voter perspective, lose sight of this trend called platform or network data business models. These things are on steroids. And they maybe it's because they lack technical awareness. I really don't know why they come up with the positions they come up with. But they, this is the trend they should be focused upon, not worrying about the fact that Jobs have moved around the world uh, for, you know, labor, say labor arbitrage or whatever purposes, when that's not relevant anymore. Because <laughs> you can have one of these things anywhere, and you can ship anywhere, you can move packets of information anywhere. None of that matters anymore. <laughs> but they're talking about things that were relevant 25 years ago. Uh, and hopefully they don't institute policy that was relevant 25 years ago in this environment because it certainly could be an impact to a platform-based business model. And you see some of that, as we know, in France and other places like that. But the, my point being is that you have to be cognizant of this technology shift. It is massive. Uh, I think, you know, we're saying, I've never seen, any, I mean, I worked in tech for 40 years. I'm involved with five startups in this space just to learn and work with young people and try to help them. Uh, but I mean, it's, it, I've never seen it move this fast. I mean, we've talked about, I used to talk about eras of technology, mainframe, mini, client server. They were 10 to 15 year cycles. This thing is on steroids. And, and it's moving very, very quickly. Uh, I mean, a great example here, I know everybody looks at these eye poppy market caps, you know, right? And they say, oh my God, look at that, half a, you know, half a trillion, 300 billion, blah, blah, blah. What, what they lose sight of on the market cap is the scale and what happened. 200 countries, 2 billion users, 200 countries, 200, 190 countries, Airbnb, LinkedIn, 200 countries. I mean, it probably took IBM 40 to 50 years to get to 60 countries in the old models. You have a multinational model. I mean, these guys are brand new and they're already globally scaled. And they have this incredible efficiency because of this platform, which is, you know, as they think about it, they view it as great engineering. If you work with these companies, they obsess on product and scale. And, and like I said, I'm involved in it right now. And there's other things they should obsess on that they don't. We can talk about that later when I go to one of the former, future charts. But they obsess on that. But what I think that they, as they, they, I'm not sure they understand the implication of the flexibility in the business model that it creates. I don't. I, don't, I think they have this intuitive belief. I don't think they've connected. I mean, I'm working with a lot of young people, so I don't think it's connected to them that so much flexibility. If you go back in time on IBM, if you were entering a country, you'd have to put in all those systems in that country. You'd have to put a data center in that country. You'd have to put in manufacturing in that country. You'd have to have distribution partners in that country. All that is eliminated. It's eliminated because of this business design point. You know, and it really is phenomenal. Now, there are issues with the design, which we'll talk about later. But I think the key thing here is not the eye poppy market caps. And you can argue whether it's a bubble or not bubble. And there are people in this room that know more about that than I do. I'm much more on the scale and the subscription base, or that's called clients or customers, that they were able to achieve in a very, very short period of time. And this is what's happening. And of course, they all get a very large position. They would seek for dominance. They won't use those words. Now they have lawyers advising them. But they want a large, protected position so that people won't enter because you know, Google's dominant in search and advertising. <coughs> so therefore, you know, why would you enter? You know, unless you're Facebook, but you would not go through that traditional model. I mean, 
I mean, I'm sure if you're, Uber's not on this chart, it's the same thing. They would like to be the dominant position on ride sharing. Now, there's Lyft and others today, but nonetheless, you know, Amazon and retail, et cetera, right? That's always the goal. Uh, so <coughs> if you contrast that, in the center, uh, we've talked about looking at areas that you could transform a company. What were the, there are lots of business processes in a company. I'm on the left-hand side of the chart. We picked six that were probably the most impactful of all the processes within a company. But you know, obviously, sales and marketing, supply chain, which is a tr tremendous portion of your cost structure if you're any kind of industrial products company. Innovation, IP, culture is key, financial management, globally, currencies, those types of issues you have to deal with accounting, et cetera. And obviously, market access, we call government trust. They were, you know, in a traditional model, if you were transforming an IBM, where would you, we started with supply chain and a global supply chain and saved like $8 billion by making it one global supply chain. But that, that's where, you know, these were the key fundamental processes which gave you speed, commonality of product, et cetera, et cetera, but also drove tremendous cost savings in inventory and parts and all that stuff that you deal with, right? Now, on the other side of this, so, what you have is like the building rich networks, that's the scaling point. It's the point of you know, this network effect of how can you go from zero to two billion subscribers in a very, very short period of time, and, and how do you do that? Uh, common values across the ecosystems, common value, brand value proposition. If I go back to the traditional, you know, they might not think of it that way, but they're really creating a common set of brand values everywhere they operate in the world, and a culture within the company, which we say is very, very important, to live up to that. I mean, if you go out in Silicon Valley, everybody wants to change the world. Uh, if you're applying to the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, your first line of your application says, I'm going to change the world. And you have to fill in the blanks, right? You know, th that's the process. I mean, my son just applied. Unfortunately, he didn't get in. But anyway, so first sentence is, change the world. And then talk about whatever you want to talk about. So, but that, you know, that's the point of all this, and that's, and, and that's the mindset of the impact they'd like to have. Plus, it also appeals to millennials. I mean, not, not to dwell on that point, uh, which I'm a long way from. But, but nonetheless, so, but back to the management system, if you say, well, where do these guys get in trouble, where do they get challenged, go back to this earning government trust. You know, because this whole thing, the reaction to the gig economy, strikes in France with taxi drivers, the restrictions now on who can and who cannot drive an Uber car, et cetera. All those sort of, uh, you know, what are the requirements of quality for Airbnb lodging? You know, all those things are in the area of government trust. So that basically the model, there's a lot of the traditional model that needs to help them as they create these future platform models. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we do with CGE, because I'm, I'm kind of leading into that, but I'll get there later. But fundamentally, you know, there's a, there is a combination of these factors that need to be applied and need to be studied. That's our view, because it's not as simple as I can create the new and all this other stuff doesn't matter anymore. It does still matter in, in today's environment. The other thing which is fascinating to us is this, what you've seen in asset values of, of these companies versus traditional models. And again, they're very asset-like. I mean, manufacturing, factories, et cetera, refineries, pipelines, what have you, aircraft, you know, go back to a lot of traditional business models. You, know, you see they're very asset-like. They're basically software companies. I mean, they're, they're really software companies at the end of the day that they're leveraging. Uh, relative to your traditional guys, you know, an IBM, a GE, an ExxonMobil, et cetera, that would have huge asset bases. So they're getting tremendous leverage and tremendous return on capital as a result of this business model because you don't have the asset intensity. The other side of it is that how do you value these things? I mean, we've also done some work on what is valuations in today's environment? And, and if you're in today's environment and you're looking at asset intensive, in the old days it was you take the balance sheet, you, you quantify the value of the assets, that would correlate to a stock price, and that was a traditional way of valuating a company, right? That's no longer the case. So what do you value in these? Right? Are, you know, how, do you, how do you actually put a tangible value around when these companies become a trillion dollar market cap company based on very few assets? It's basically a big idea, a lot of software and smart kids running around. I mean, how do you value that in today's environment? Again, we have a study on going on there as well on valuation of the assets. 
But you can see this interesting trend in mix, but a lot of valuation or a lot of capital flows, look at it from that perspective, where is capital flowing? Capital is flowing to the asset light models. And you see that in their market valuations, right? Investment is flowing to the innovation side of the economy. It's not flowing to the traditional side of the economy, which is, again, not to, not to get off on some political tangent. This is what they should understand. You know, they, they, these, the political leaders, should under, wherever they are in the world, need to understand where capital is flowing, right? And that is where it's flowing. It's not flowing back to the traditional models, which they talk about, right? Capital is not going to flow there regardless of what they say. They can give you $1,000 for every person you hire. You're not going to put it there. You're going to put it where the future opportunities are. Uh, so the mission of CGE, uh, basically a little bit of background is to, uh, what we try to do, I'll start with why did we start this thing. Uh, I just, I, when I got out of, when I stopped working, I needed this a project other than get dragged into political commissions and things like that uh, in startups. So the idea was I had this belief, a personal belief, that professional schools that are really, really are wonderful. I mean, they really are great. And we partner with a lot of them. Like we're working with MIT, we work with Stanford, we're working with uh, Peking University, Indian Institute of Management, INSEAD, et cetera. So we have great partners. But there are gaps in what they're preparing future leaders and when the skills they need for the future. We're nonprofits, so we're not trying to compete. We don't, you know, we're not selling IP. We're not doing curriculum. You know, we're not in that business of education. But we felt that we, there are gaps that needs to be, need to be addressed, and that if we could have, offer a service and create some intellectual property or some capability or in learnings around those gaps, we could provide a service to young people. I mean, that was the, that was the design point. We've been lucky that we've been able to get a lot of people to work with us, similar to the Media Lab. But you know, we've been, we've been great in that regard. Uh, we have a lot of people participating. Digital supply change is a study we're doing. What's the effect of the supply chain and digitization and those kinds of things? You know, 3D manufacturing, robotics, et cetera, you know, right? But, uh, but, you know, a lot of supporters, a lot of partners around the world. But the idea of the, of the center is to take something like this platform business model and study the management system associated. I alluded to the where that the orientation uh, of the platform business model as it scales is challenged. And it's challenged by things not of technology or not of finance or capital flows. It's challenged by societal issues, right? It's challenged by the value proposition of the brand, the marketing. You know, something happens with a with an Uber driver, you know, blast across the world in social media. That's the challenge of it, right? No different if something something happens to an Airbnb individual staying in a home of some kind. You know, blast across you know social media immediately. That's the challenge associated with a lot of these things. Move to the other side, the enterprise side of the platform business models. I mean, the challenge, again, is there going to be a security of data. I mean, um, at the end of the day, it won't just be governments restricting data flows like the EU. It's going to be associated with how do you protect all that sensitive information. And you can't just say the cloud's more secure than traditional models. You have to actually do it. You know, you have to do the technologies associated with protecting that privacy if you're going to deploy a cloud-based or really a platform-based business model, would that be Workday or anybody else, Salesforce, et cetera, in that space, those issues aren't going to go away. And they have to be resolved. Or you'll be restricted in your flexibility to grow. So that's what we are. We're just trying to fill that gap of learning. Uh, we have a great team now. We have a good, terrific board. We have excellent people on our board, great fellows like Peter has been working on platform business models. And so. We're up and running. We have some pretty, pretty sizable scale now. So we're pretty excited about what we've been doing. Uh, and this leads to <coughs> where we're focused here. And I've kind of alluded to this. because This, is, this will be the summary chart. We're, we're looking at the intersection. You know, everybody says in technology, if you go back after 40 years in technology, I've been through many technology shifts. And it was always going to eliminate everything that ever existed before. Remember, office automation, you'd never use paper again. You never would use paper again, right? And then we've got to this thing where Bill Gates gave a speech. You, there was no need for a retail bank. Well, we use paper in their retail banks. And then my point is the physical world will always exist. So the question is the physical world doesn't go away. In some places, there's no substitute for the physical world. An airplane, you, you have to go someplace. There's not a substitute. There's no transporter today that's going to digitize you and put you in Beijing in an hour, right? So, you have to get on the plane. You have to have energy. You have to produce it. You have to get it out of the ground. You have to refine it. You know, all those things in the physical world, you have to ship a good. 
It has to go on a boat or a plane or something or a rail. It's got to go someplace. That never goes away. However, there are augmentations to that that digitalization can have a tremendous impact to. And especially if you're not tied to a truly physical world, like you're finding oil when you're refining it or doing chemical processes or what have you, and you're really into this thing of a service value proposition, which is giving someone a more convenient ride or a more convenient lodging or more a convenient way to move money around the world. I'm involved with a company that's up here in Boston called Circle, which is you know kind of a, a digital payment system, the multi-currency digital payment system. I mean, if you think of it, all a payment is is an information packet. You can put anything in the packet. It's a total platform at the end of the day. It's secure, it's encrypted, et cetera, it's protected. But it's, a black, it's all it is, right? You're moving an information packet around. Well, you really don't need a lot of brick and mortar and all these intersection, all these handoffs along the way, you know, these friction points. So there are opportunities where the digitalization will get rid of friction points. Oh, you can't find a cab. You, don't, you want to send your kids money, and my kids are in uh, Europe right now. I want to wire on money. I just cir circle in the cash, what have you, right? And they can translate it to euros, uh, those kinds of things. But, but at the same time, now back to what we would study, what is, if you're a traditional enterprise or a traditional business, how do you take advantage of these platform-based business models? I mean, I, I use the term, if you're on the right-hand side of the angels, or the right side of the angels, a startup, it's terrific, because you don't have all this past to deal with. And that's why I invest in the, in the right side of the angels. I don't invest in the past, I invest in the right side of the angels. You know, my friend Steve is out there, he'll tell you the same thing. You invest in the future, you don't invest in the past. However, if you're in the past, how do you do it? How do you get there? You know, that's a hard thing to do. We talked about IBM. Believe me, this is hard work to move something that's 100 years old into these future dimensions with half a million people in your workforce who liked what they were doing the day before, before you sold their business. So that's a really hard thing to do. So this is what we're studying, is this intersection point between the two. So thank you for your time. I hope you found it insightful. I, I found it entertaining for me nonetheless, and that I think, Peter, you're the next speaker, right? Peter will go through a lot of the details. Oh. Oh, I'm, I'm fine, yeah. All right. I'm Your good. Your voice can handle it. I'm going to drink some tea. I'm going to get you. question, please step up to the microphone. <laughs> I see Michael. Here, Here we, we go. <laughs> I would still, this is fascinating. You've clearly rigorously thought this through. You put in a successor at, at IBM. She's made fundamental changes. I'm not going to ask you to give her advice ex post, but culturally, what did you know her most difficult challenge would be to get her to do the same kind of rigorous thinking of the risks and opportunities that you've outlined here? Well, I mean, if you think about the challenge, which we saw at the time, I mean, uh, look, we, I, I gave a speech on horizontal scalable computing with Eric Schmidt in 2007, which became cloud. It got named cloud. So it isn't like we missed the shift. The, the question is, uh, we saw the shift. We saw the PC shift, remember? We just didn't see it as a platform. Uh, and that, uh, as a result of missing that shift, we uh, lost half our, well, yeah, probably half our workforce. We went from 412,000 to 207,000 people. That's about half your workforce, right, in that transition, which was quite painful. Um, so the key is that if you look at the technology, here's the challenge of the technology. It's twofold. One is that you know, if, you're now, if you are an enterprise tech company, and you see it for all enterprise techs, so I can talk about it this way, because I, really, I mean, I've been out of IBM for five years. I'm not current, and I shouldn't comment anyway, obviously. But talk about enterprise tech, which is fine. You can translate to anybody you want, Dell, HP, SAP, et cetera, you know, Cisco, EMC, right? take everybody in enterprise tech. It's not that you don't see the shift, it's your, it's your business model, it's your financial structure, it's a business model. Because you're fundamentally going to this digital uh, platform based, it's a subscription model. But your financial system is a transactional system. You sell stuff every 90 days and you publish your results, whether that's storage or PCs or services, whatever it happens to be, you know, it's a transactional sale. So when you go from transactional sales to a subscription sale, your revenue is then deferred, which therefore you have your cost structures out of line with the deferral. That's, that's the, that is the challenge of an enterprise tech company. And then how do you deal with it? Well, you could go take it private like Michael did. You could break it up like Meg's doing. You know, there's lots of ways to deal with it, right? 
But fundamentally, that is a very difficult transition. Um, you know, I would argue a way to deal with it, which other people haven't done, would be quite different than that. But that's a point of view. Uh, I mean, I, my point of view would be is if you really are going to make that bet on the platform business model and you're going to go to a subscription business, I mean, this is hard to do. You can do it as a new CEO. I couldn't do it as an old CEO of 10 years in the job. You know, longest sitting CEO in the history of IBM, I wouldn't have stood up and said this. But as a new CEO, you could walk up and say, hey, look, we're going to this model, subscription versus transactional. Our cost structures are out of line, and we're going to get rid of half, you know, 200,000 people, and that's where we're going to go. You get hit for about a year, you know, right? You still have your job, and see if you can execute. But if you don't, you're into this unfortunate period where you go through quarterly, quarterly declines, and the street beats you up for four or five years, and it's not any fun. A, a bunch of angels here in, in the crowd today. What's the rhyme, reason, or rubric that you use to um, invest and get involved in startup companies? Well, the first thing I do is I follow smart people. Uh, I am not good at this. I'll be the first to admit it. I have very good friends who are very good at this. Uh, among a very close friend of mine, Jim Breyer, who's had a track record, Excel, Facebook, et cetera. So, you know, they're really good. So, um, uh, so, I, when, so the first thing is I follow people who know what they're doing. That's a good advice in life, right? The other thing is, I don't do consumer tech because I am incompetent in consumer. I sold the PC business, okay, right? I ran it first before I sold it, all right? So, shows you. I, <coughs> consumer electronics for IBM was not a good fit. Their research base was too big. But anyway, so uh, I do enterprise tech. So, I follow people that know. Now, now, what we bet on, quite honestly, it's not that hard to figure out, is a future space with tremendous opportunity, i.e., fiction points. Uh, and then, the, you know, can you eliminate friction points? And I know a lot about enterprise, needless to say. I mean, I know a lot about financial services and banking. I, a, that was the biggest customer set of IBM other than the U.S. government, so it was banking, right? So I have a lot of knowledge about that, those kinds of spaces. And then the other side of it is you bet on people. And you're betting on people at the end of the day. And, and initially, you're betting on product engineering. And then very quickly, you're betting on what I'll call management expertise. Uh, which is if you go through these startups, right, I mean, it, it, they, they change very, very quickly, quite honestly, because once they get the product right, which could take some time, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not months, it's years, but once you get the product right, then they have to deal with all the other association issues of scale, and that's really where they need some help, where guys like I come into play. How do you scale something, you know, right? How do you build talent? How do you scale it? How do you enter markets? Those kinds of things. And so it's a complementary set of skills. Is, uh, as my friends and I say to each other, they have no idea what I'm talking about, and they have no idea what they're talking about. So it's a good match, you know, right? It's a good match. <laughs> we don't overlap at all. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so there's a tension that I'm seeing between these platform-based business models and um, internal organizational management structures and strategies. Um, it seems like the man on the management piece, we're not moving nearly as fast as these platform-based businesses are moving. I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, quarterly goals, yes, uh, right. performance reviews, and such. Um, would you be able to speak a little bit about this tension? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, it, you know, a lot of the things that, if you think about, then I'm, I'm, I'll go to the startup side of, versus the traditional side. So they're, they're different, right? But let's start with the startup side of things. I mean. Quarterly goals and those kinds of reviews, when your, your whole focus for the first few years of your existence is, is the platform or the product itself, right? I mean, the key is really going to be the technology, the, 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 the measurement of the innovation of the technology, your product plan and where you're meeting those milestones, and your burn rate, your capital burn rate. That's it. I mean, nothing else really matters. I mean, that, that's, that's what we go through all the time. We're in your product cycles. You said this will be the product plan. Where are you on that plan? Are you hitting those milestones, yes or no, right? And then what's the burn rate? Are you, are you, are you productive and it's relative to a burn rate, not relative to a metric that we have used at IBM for development the productivity, but to that kind of a burn rate? In traditional companies, the problem is that you have to let that go on, you know, and not encumber it. Uh, so, now, so I'm shifting on you. I mean, a lot of traditional companies, what they do, which I think is a mistake, I'm um, on boards of some of these companies, they go to Silicon Valley, you know, I'll introduce them to some people, and they come back with these great ideas. And what they do is they go out and buy them, right? They go out and buy them, they will buy it. 
But the problem is it's not buying it. It's the integrating it into their existing management system and their culture. That's the issue. It's not buying anything and buy anything. It's how do you integrate it and how do you make the cultures work? And that's where they all fall apart. So they ought to start with, how can I build it myself? What is the culture I need in my management system to attract and retain the talent pool? And then maybe go buy it if you want to go buy it or build it yourself. But they, they don't solve that fundamental issue. And then sure enough, you know, as a board, I'll say, well, it's no surprise that three years later you're unhappy because you put it into a structure where it, well, it doesn't culturally fit. So you have to kind of leave it off. I mean, we did 112 software acquisitions when I was a CEO, so 112 of them, and our track record was pretty good. But we didn't, we didn't force them into the, we forced them into the financial system, but not to the cultural system of IBM, unless we were going to totally integrate it as an add-on to some of our core, you know, called WebSphere kind of technology businesses, those kinds of things. But if it was something that was separate, like security or what have you, that was separate, or data analytics, you know, Cognos and then SAS and those kinds of things, we kind of set it into its own cultural base. But that's the key to the whole thing. So uh, the measurements are different if you're starting up. If you're an existing, I start with go look at your culture and does it fit before you go out and invest a lot of money and try to say, well, this will be, it's always going to work. Because it, it, it tends to, a lot of these things fail in the integration. It's mostly because of cultural fit. It's not because of technology. Now, the other thing is, oh, by the way, they say, well, you don't need any of this structure. I mean, I'll give you the, uh, the opposite side. Back to the startups. I get these meetings. They say, we don't need structure. I say, of course you don't need structure. I hate bureaucracy. Okay, I, hate bur I want free food at work, too. Okay, I got it, right? No drugs, but free food's fine. Can we get off the drug thing? Okay, get off the drugs for a while. But Anyway, I'm not making these things up. So anyway, please leave the drugs at home, not at work, whatever. <clears throat> then I say, well, let's, so how, there's only 30 people in this company. Do you know what each other does? We're not, not going to have an org chart. No work chalk, no titles. But what do you do when you come to work? Let's say, can we have agreement on that? This went on for a full day. Well, uh, hi, uh, Kristen's my darling. And Kristen goes, oh, I'm the CTO. Well, no, you're not. I am. Oh, you, well, wait, who is the CTO? I mean, let's, let's work this out. What does the CTO do? Well, I'm the CEO. I said, well, okay, so you have, you're responsible for the money. No, 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 I don't do the money. Yeah, you do do the money. You're the CEO. You know, so we go on. Who's the product manager? You know, right? Uh, I'm a lawyer, but I also do HR. Okay, so there's a difference between the two. So my only <laughs> full day meeting, and finally at the full day meeting, at the end of the day, we had 30 people with what they did. And my point was, all you want to when you come into work, where do you get help? You know, we want to go get help from somebody or a sales guy. You got I want to get a pricing done. Where do you go for help? Okay, that's all the goal was. Eight hours later, we could get that established. So there's some things that are necessary, even in a small organization, like what do you do when you come to work, even if you're sitting on pillows versus chairs, you know, right? You still need to know what you do when you come to work. Yes, sir. Hello, um, Alexis Rimets. Uh, I'm interested actually in the transition between physical and digital, uh, and then you said that the traditional physical models will always remain. Um, I believe that there is, uh, there is an opportunity here for, for traditional physical companies that produce products to transform yes. into platforms, but in a way that to keep the physical products. Now they are talking about uh, pricing the physical products. You buy a product for a certain price, but the price is actually a cost plus a profit, and uh, uh, the price is set as a, as a, a promise of value, but what value only only happens when the product is used. Like if you buy a gallon of gas, the value for you is not when you buy it, but when you drive with, with it. And maybe yes. even a friend drives with you and, and can extract some value from, from this gallon of gas. So I believe that the physical company can use the product actually to, to in, induce, um, I, I, I would call them the, the, the network effects. So to, to use it, the, the physical products as a glue to, to expand its, its, uh, its network and <coughs> actually maybe price it even for free, like, I don't know, this, this, this is worth nothing uh, if it's not used. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting because uh, is there an application of the freeware model, right, which is that you basically, your first phase is free, go back to a lot of these subscription-based business models, and then as you add function on top, do you pay for the advanced function or the enhanced value of the gallon of gas, right? Are you paying for the incremental value generated in the gallon of gas? Um, is there a model there? Um, 
The challenge associated with it, is if you think about the difference, is the, I'll call it the variable cost, right? If you're now you're going to price this way. In the physical world, you're, that, that core hard thing, whatever it happens to be, has a real cost associated with it. In the other subscription model, it's basically just software and people wrote some code. So that's really, your, your, very, your incremental costs are zero to scale, whereas in a product world, you have to produce this thing, so there is fixed costs associated with doing that, which is, becomes the challenge. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't put digital services on top of the physical. I mean, I'll give you a great example. I think you see this in the Internet of Things. There's a tremendous opportunity in the Internet of Things for machine-to-machine -machine, um, cognitive capabilities where it automatically adjusts. Take the grid. It right, happened to be in use, and we were talking about the grid, where you could automatically, with machine-to-machine -machine technologies, the Internet of Things, load, balance, and store energy. I mean, this is hard work ahead of us, but yes, could you do that? Right? That would be an alternative whereby you could take these things that were the physical assets, but the value on top is really, let's call it the load balancing value add that was associated into the pricing model where you can get some value for that. Uh, services propositions where you monitor, like you do in large computer systems for GE engines and aircraft and those medical systems and hospitals, all those kinds of things, where you put that service proposition for the Internet of Things on top of that. I just think that the, the balance associated with it, why it becomes complex on a, just on a, and, and the dimension of pricing. Now, I'll add another dimension of digital supply chains, but instead of the dimension of pricing, you have to deal with this issue that there really is a real cost associated with that, that physical asset that you're dealing with, whereas in these other models, which I had on the previous chart, it's just people that wrote some code. There is not a, the increment, there's no manufacturing to produce that next line of code, really, right? So your, your variable costs are basically free, so it's easy to run that freeware kind of a model. Um, but however, go back to the physical world, where digitalization really takes place, I think, and has great potential, or in areas like you know, 3D printing and robotics and those kinds of things, with intelligent manufacturing. I think there's going to be a tremendous shift in supply chains around the world because of these digital technologies. And all the associated things that you thought about as far as shipment of goods and where you located manufacturing facilities and you know, egress and access and all those and tariffs and duties and all those kinds of things, you can really come up with a very refined digital supply chain that gets you uh, out of that that creates value. I mean, you can pr produce all your spare parts in real time in a distribution center in that country it operates, even if your manufacturing hub happened to be in China versus, you know, mid-best United States kinds of things. But it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard, hard thing to do. I mean, maybe it's something worth studying. I mean, back to where you would do some research. But you still have this physical cost component that you're dealing with as you build something. It doesn't go away. 